All right, Bart Ehrman, thank you very much for joining me. Today, I'd like to talk about an important development in biblical textual criticism, and that was John Mill and his work on the 100 manuscripts that he had access to. He found 30,000 variants in those manuscripts. Is that correct? Uh, he found a lot more than that. The ones that he printed were 30,000. <laughs> so who was John Mill and how did this work come about? John Mill was a scholar in Oxford who was a, uh, a, a textual expert. When publishers had to print the New Testament, they had to choose which words to print in every, for every verse. And they, they had to base this on, the, on manuscripts that had come down through the ages. Um, most of the printers of the Greek New Testament were simply following a form of the text that was produced by Erasmus in the uh, 16th century. So in the early 1500s, Erasmus produced his, uh, his text of the New Testament, 1560. Scholars have been discovering manuscripts since then, and scholars who are studying these manuscripts realized that a manuscript they're reading, a handwritten copy made centuries earlier, in places disagreed with um, Erasmus's text that he had, had printed. And John Mill was aware of this as a scholar, and he decided to start looking at manuscripts and he started realizing that, in fact, there were lots of differences. And he decided to print a New Testament that would give a, uh, on the page, there'd be a few lines of the Greek New Testament at the top, a few, like a verse or two. And then on the bottom of the page, he lists places where these manuscripts were different from each other, where they had different wordings. And so he was, a, he was this Oxford scholar that spent 30 years uh, producing this edition. <laughs> it came out in 1707. And he... Um, he died about two weeks after he published it, but uh, it caused a huge furor because all he quoted, uh, you know, thirty thousand places where these manuscripts are different from each other. Now, when we say textual variance in these manuscripts, what what does that term mean? So, a textual variant is where you've got um, you've got two manuscripts. By manuscript, we mean handwritten copies that were made by scribes uh, any time from the second century up until the invention of printing and somewhat beyond it, and written copies. If you've got, say you've got two copies of John and you're looking out, each one has John chapter one. And so these manuscripts don't have chapters and verses in them, but you know, you, you do. And so you say, okay, how does this manuscript read chapter one, verse one? How's this one say one, verse one? And are they word for word the same or not? If, they're, if, you've, got, if you've got a verse that has two different wordings in it, well, how big, how, you know, if one word says God and the other says Christ in the same, for the same word, you know, if it says God loved the world, it says Christ loved the world. Well, God and Christ, each man would have a different word. That'd be a textual variant. The texts vary at that point. Sometimes it's just a word. Sometimes one set, one manuscript will have a, have a sentence that the other manuscript won't have. That'd be a textual variant. And so a textual variant is any unit of meaning that differs between the smallest unit meaning that differs that differs between one, one manuscript and another. When you have a unit of different of, of meaning that differs, that's a textual variant. People accuse John Mill of attacking the Bible or attacking biblical faith uh, in his time. You said that he died just two weeks after he published this work, so he wasn't around to defend himself. Some people came to his defense, though. Can you tell me about this conflict that happened over over his work? Yeah. Um, so what happened was he publishes this thing and he thought he was just kind of helping out the world, you know, because he's just pointing out, you know, we need to figure out what the, what the words were because you're all using this printed Greek New Testament, but we have other manuscripts that actually word it differently and we got to decide which ones are original. <laughs> if you're interested in knowing what the words of God are, <laughs> you better figure out which words are the text. And so he thought he was doing the world a service. But when people got this thing, and when scholars got, of course, this this was just in the level high level scholarship. People could read Greek and Latin. He produced this. The, the book itself was in Latin, and the the manuscripts are in Greek. And you know, and so uh, so you got to. It's only for scholars, but these scholars started reading this, and people started saying, "Whoa, wait a second, that's a lot of textual variation. There's thirty thousand places. What?" And some people said that he was. Um, he was trying to uh, instill distrust in the Bible. He was trying to ruin the Bible's reputation. And 
Uh, and so especially kind of 18th, sense, 18th century um, uh, predecessors to modern fund- fundamentalists were saying, this is wrong. You know, it's like a book burning. We need to burn this book. This is crazy. You can't have, you can't have somebody telling us all this. And the people, so you have these people saying, he, he's trying to make the text of the New Testament uncertain. That's not good. And, and his supporters are saying, wait a second. He, he didn't invent these 30,000 places. He's just telling us they exist. And if you don't think they exist, just read the manuscripts yourself. You'll see they exist. So are you preferring to be ignorant? <laughs> and so it became a big controversy between whether it was, uh, you know, what, what to do about all these 30,000 places. How did this affect scholarship on the biblical text? And also, how did it affect the way that Christian apologetics might have developed to defend the faith? Yeah, well, apologetics, you know, has always been around. Uh, Christian apologies, uh, apologetics have, have gone back to the early second century, at least, early, or some, some sense of it in the first century. And every time a new issue comes up, of course, you've got to have apologists uh, respond to it, just as, you know, just as when Darwin came along, apologists had to start talking about things like uh, creationism. Uh, and in this case, you've got, you got these people saying, look, we don't even know what the text said. And I'll tell you, the people who really who really loved that, um, you know, in the, in the early 18th century, there weren't a lot of atheists floating around. There were some, uh, you know, some French deists, for example, didn't really believe in the Christian God and so forth. Most people were Christian, but most people were either Catholic or Protestants. And the Protestants, since Luther, had been insisting that the Bible is the sole authority. Uh, the words of the Bible are God's words to humans. And the Catholics are the ones who took Mill, who was a, who was a Protestant. Uh, they took Mill and said, see, you don't even know what the words are. <laughs> You're basing your faith on a book. You don't even know what the wording of the book is. And so the apologists weren't going after like agnostics and atheists the way most are today. The apologists were going after Catholics and saying, uh, no, 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 like you have these things, but they don't matter for anything. And we pretty much know what they say, what the wording is. And, you know, it's completely bogus and it's not God's fault. The copyists messed up his scriptures. And so, so that was the kind of thing. And so today it's kind of like what happens today when you have, um, when you have, you have a scholar arguing, look, we don't know what some passages say. And so we really, you know, we don't know what these the words are in places. And you have a fundamentalist Bible scholar and say, oh, no, it's all completely insignificant. You're really blowing it up way beyond what's used. And so you, like, you can hear debates like this on YouTube. And uh, that's uh, and it's the same thing in the 18th century. Some Christians would obviously find this troubling to their faith today. But I'm wondering about historically what the effect would have been on Christian faith if someone would have learned this. Would finding textual variants in biblical manuscripts actually have been some kind of defeater or or severe challenge to, to Christian faith? Well, it was in the 18th century. It was the beginning of biblical scholarship generally. So today, biblical scholars do all sorts of things that, and many historical scholars do things that are um, difficult for, um, especially uh, conservative Christians to to deal with in that they they just think that these are contrary to the faith. And a lot of things that historical scholars do today and have been doing for a long, over, you know, 150 years or so, are things like deciding which words Jesus quoted in the Gospels are not what he really said, <laughs> you know, or what contradictions there are between John and Mark, or whether Paul really wrote 1 Timothy. No. And so, you know, the scholars are doing all sorts of things that are problematic for faith. But this was the beginning of it. When scholars started realizing that the uh, that the very words of the text were problematic, that there are, that there are differences, and that sometimes it's hard to know what the author originally wrote, and there are disagreements, and there are places where we don't know which words the author wrote. Um, this was this was very problematic for people, and uh, some people it led some people it started leading people away from the faith altogether. Um, this, this was being used by the English deists in the 18th century who were kind of notorious for being the first ones to start proclaiming openly doubts, whether there's a, there's a God. Um, they used this kind of evidence as reasons to convince people. Um, 
And so it started that way. But the other thing that it started was uh, scholars who are very devoted Christians realizing we need to figure out ways to get back to the original text that the apostles wrote, because we have all of these manuscripts and more and more started being discovered. And the more manuscripts you got, the more variations you got until like Mills 30,000 seemed like nothing <laughs> eventually. And so these scholars started thinking, whoa, we, not, we need to develop methods to figure out what the original said. And so it, de- it started a whole process of scholarship, which then led to other scholarship, which led to other scholarship to where we are today with historical scholarship of the New Testament. Okay, now we focused on textual differences in the Bible. Let's talk about some theological differences we might find in the text. Jesus, obviously the most important figure in Christianity, but the Apostle Paul might be said to be a, a close second. I'm, I'm wondering how close. What were the differences between Paul and Jesus' teachings? Right. So this is the this is the topic of my of the course that I've just done, Paul and Jesus, the Great Divide, <laughs> and uh, that's the question: how how similar are they? How different are they? And is if we just had Jesus, if we didn't have Paul, would we have Christianity or not? Um, another way to put that is: can we consider Jesus a Christian? And that that's kind of an interesting question, really. Because uh, Christianity, as it's usually propagated today and has been for many, many, many centuries, is a, a faith based on the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that is definitely what Paul preached, that it's Jesus' death and resurrection that put a person into a right standing before God. But since the 19th century, especially somewhat in the 18th, especially in the 19th century, scholars have started to realize that Jesus actually wasn't preaching that message. Jesus is preaching a message of that there's a there's a kingdom of God that's coming and we need to prepare for it. And you need to repent and get ready for this coming kingdom of God. And you need to turn back to God and do what God tells you to do. And the question arose, is that the same message as Jesus, as Paul? Is Paul preaching that you need to keep the law of God that God gave gave the Jews so that you could be right with God to enter the kingdom? Or is he preaching something else? Is this is his proclamation of the death and resurrection of Jesus the same as Jesus' proclamation of the Sermon on the Mount? <laughs> are they are they different? Are they the same? Are they continuous? How do you work that out? So that's what my course is about. Yeah, sounds like a pretty big topic. Can you tell me more about the details of the course? When is this happening? How many lectures are we going to have here? So there are eight lectures. Uh, they're between 30 and 40 minutes each. Uh, and the way it works is I, I start out by talking, I give three lectures devoted to what we know about Jesus preaching. And so what, why it's difficult to know about Jesus. What did Jesus apparently think about himself? What did Jesus think about how you can be right with God? How did Jesus teach his ethics? So I do all do three lectures on Jesus, which of course could go on for, you know, eight million lectures, but I do it in three lectures. Uh, and then I do the same thing with Paul. Why is it difficult to know what Paul really said and did? And what does Paul think about Jesus? And what does Paul teach you think about how you have how you have salvation? And what does Paul think about the importance of ethics and and so, you know, and how you behave? And then so I, I lay out Jesus, then Paul, and then the final two lectures are comparing the two. Uh, and that's where the rubber meets the road. One thing the, the this one of the lectures is trying to figure out why Paul says so little about the ministry of Jesus. I mean, if you just look at what Paul says about Jesus' life, from the, just from the time he's born to the time he dies, it's very little. Why is that? If Paul was supporting Jesus' religion, why does he tell you about Jesus? Like what he preached, or like what he did, or what? He, or why doesn't he? That's a good question, a good historical question. And then another question is, whatever reason Paul had for not mentioning more about Jesus, because he didn't know anymore, or didn't think it's relevant, or didn't think it's important, or didn't, whatever, whatever the reason is, apart from that, is Paul's message the same as Jesus' message, or is it different? If it's different, is it fundamentally different? Are they different religions? Or are they kind of the same? Or are they absolutely the same? How do you, how do you work that out? And so the course is doing all of those really kind of big, major issues. All right, I'm greatly looking forward to that. I have been in attendance of, I, I think, about 90% of the courses that you've put out at this point, and I've, I've learned a lot, really enjoyed them. Now, lastly, 
a lot of us have, especially if we've read Misquoting Jesus, your, your most popular book, we know about some textual variants in uh, the writings about Jesus. But are there any interesting textual variants in uh, Paul's writings that have been copied over time? Uh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> um, involving uh, things such as from, from from really little things that are, wow, that's kind of interesting to, oh my God, <laughs> things. And um, in th including things, for example, uh, such as in Paul's letters, is Jesus ever called God? Well, it depends which textual variants you go with. Um, there's there's kind of an interesting anecdote about this. It's, well, it's it's a book that, uh, you know, is, is attributed to Paul. Uh, it's in other words, the author claims to be Paul. Today, scholars doubt whether Paul wrote 1 Timothy uh, or not. But there's this really interesting textual variant that is related to this. I'll tell you about because it's related to Paul. So in 1 Timothy, there's this passage in uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 that says that, uh, talk about Christ, um, um, who uh, you know did so and so and so and so, 1 Timothy 3.16. Christ, who so and so and so and so. Uh, but some manuscripts say Christ, namely God, who did so and so and so and so, right? It's a difference between is it who is it the word who or the word God? Okay, you with me? So that the difference between these two words is that whether it's who or whether it's God. In one case, the author is calling Christ God. In the other case, he's just saying who. If he calls it God or who, both of those words are two-letter words in Greek, and. Who is a, an O followed by an S? So Omicron Sigma. Okay? The God is a theta followed by an S, and the theta looks like an O with a line through the middle. Okay? So the difference between who and God is the line that goes through the middle. So in the 18th century, that after John Mill, there's a guy named Vetstein who was really interested in this kind of thing and uh, the, te in the textual variants. And he was looking at the oldest surviving manuscript of Paul's letters, Codex Alexandrinus, that had always been, that had been said since it was discovered, to have at that place to have said God with a theta, zero uh, and O with a line to the middle, uh, theta sigma. And so he was looking at this manuscript and he sees that. He sees theta, line through it, and sigma. Then you look at that line through it, he realized, wait a second, that line isn't from this side of the page. That line is for a line on the other side of the page. The ink has bled through the manuscript. And so the line's not there. And so it doesn't say God. It says who? <laughs> it's, it's like this. It's a line. <laughs> but it completely changes the thing. And it ends up being uh, one of the only places in the Pauline corpus that calls Jesus God. <laughs> And so, so Scott, my point about that is, scholars get really into the nitty gritty, but it ends up mattering a lot. Thanks. To those watching who would like to check out this course and support my channel in the process, just click the link in the description and pinned comment. Now, Dr. Ehrman, thank you so much for joining me. All right, thank you. Thanks for watching. I've been Drew of Genetically Modified Skeptic. You might have noticed some studio changes recently. That's because I'm integrating some of the equipment that people have bought on my Amazon wish list. If you would like to help me continue to improve my studio, I'd like to make some more improvements to my channel and my wife's channel, The Antibot, uh, then you can check out the link in the description to see if you would like to purchase and, and basically donate something from my Amazon wish list. Of course, if you'd like to hear more from me, then subscribe. If you are an apostate in need, there are resources linked in the description to help you find community and mental health support. Remember to be kind to others in the comments, and until next time, stay skeptical.